Uh, we're lucky to have with us um, two very busy people. I think that's at least one of the things they have in common. Unlike you, right? Like, yes, but um, I will contextualize that. So we have Alina Kasparovsky, who as the slideshows is a, a founder and um, ever since the community, uh, the um, director of the Vickers Community Foundation, which was founded in 2011. And Bogdan is the co-founder and CEO of Code for Romania, which is an organization of about less or almost two years old, but already perhaps the, the largest civic tech organization in the world. And the reason why they're very busy is because, well, that's their field of work, working with communities in uh, Bucharest in Romania or internationally, but also um, I know at least about Bogdan, they have the largest international summit of the civic tech movement uh, starting it's, Monday, it's, right? Yeah, starting Monday, and it goes well with the with the talk that you just gave. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm amazed that there are other people that I don't know yet that are interested in civic technology in Romania. So yeah, we'd be happy to have you at the summit if you're interested. <laughs> so everyone's yeah. invited next week. <laughs> Um, so just, uh, I would ask to, to structure this, we have 45 minutes and we thought of having a conversation basically. Before that, for those of you that don't know, don't know the Romanian context, maybe just a brief introduction about what the Bikers Community Foundation does and also about Code for Romania and then we can ask mm -hmm. questions also from the audience. Okay. Um, hi everybody, uh, we are speaking English, it's okay yes, for it's, everybody, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, we at the Bucharest Community Foundation, like any of the 2,000 community foundations worldwide, um, raise resources from the local community and then we uh, grow the local, uh, local initiative. And we do that by raising funds, basically, and offering grants and uh, scholarships for people in the community. In uh, seven years so far, we worked with more than 300 projects uh, and groups of initiative, and we gave in the community more than 1 million euros, uh, up to our latest calculations. And um, how it works is that normally we don't work with the biggest NGOs in the local community because they already know they have their strategy, but we work with grassroots organizations and with initiative groups. And uh, this gives us uh, also a feeling, speaking about the map, and gives us a little bit of the feeling of what is the demand in the community and what are the, the areas. Uh, as you said, Code for Romania is a young organization. Uh, we were born almost three years ago, two years and a half. Uh, for the ones of you that don't know this about Romania, we had a huge fire that killed uh, dozens of people in a club in Bucharest three years ago. And that was kind of a turning point for Romanian civil society in terms of engagement, in terms of, uh, in terms of trying to contribute to, to the work of civic uh, organizations. And that's when Code for Romania started. And because of the social context, we grew very fast into the second largest civic tech organization worldwide. We have now uh, over 600 volunteers that work on our projects. Uh, and they're from all across the Romania and also from the diaspora, because Romania has a sizable uh, diaspora. What we do is mainly what uh, uh, Gruya described before. Those applications, though, we use technology to solve social problems. And we try to cover a diverse area of problems from transparency and accountability uh, to kind of making the relation between government and, uh, and citizens a bit better to helping the vulnerable groups, uh, helping uh, the environment, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the beauty of this is that technology can be of help anywhere. Um, but the interesting fact, and the one that relates to, to the conference here, is that uh, building the technology is the easiest part of what we do. The most difficult part is the research. Uh, and that's where almost most of our resources go. 
uh, before we start writing even the first line of code on any project. We go through months and months, sometimes over a year of research, from mapping the problems to uh, validating them, sitting in focus groups, uh, um, to define them as well as possible, and to build together with the stakeholders, together with partners in civil society, in government, the best solutions possible in order not to waste resources. And I, I come from academia, so that for me is very interesting because I'm still doing research, but I'm doing research that I feel has an immediate effect because we build technology based on it, and then that technology is being used, and we can see clear, you know, KPIs, clear, clear, impact, uh, clear impact of it. Um, and then the second part of what we do that relates with, with the discussion here is, is the size and the shape of our community, but more about this later. Maybe that's what actually I had in, in my, uh, my notes. Um, we talk about communities as if they're out there. So I, starting by the size of yours, I would focus a bit inward as well and focusing on those 600 people you guys have, but also focusing on something that is a global movement that has probably thousands of people. Uh, and I would start that question still locally asking, how did you get 600 people in two years in Romania and why? And again, this is about, as you mentioned, the local context. And also a bit about what is mobilizing the community now besides the big events. So maybe a bit about that, your community. Uh, so what, what <coughs> brought together 600 people, it's only a small part of it, it's our work. And the fact that when they came to Code for Romania, they found a functional system and, uh, and they were able to, to use their skills and see a product of it that is functional. Um, and there are not many of, of, of these uh, uh, organizations uh, in Romania right now, so, so people are kind of hungry for it. Uh, but the second one is, is the context, uh, the turning point that, that I was, I was mentioning, but also the fact that Romania has a sizable IT industry and also communications industry, all the, all the fields that we need for our projects. And the other good, good part is that these are probably the best paid uh, professionals in Romania. And I think that amazed me from the beginning when we started Code for Romania. I was expecting more young people, more you know, people in university or just after university joining Code for Romania. That didn't happen. Uh, most of them are 30 to 35 year olds. They're senior or very senior in their work. Uh, may, most probably they, they reach a level of uh, financial comfort already and they have enough time to give back. So this is, this is the, the type of uh, professionals we, we gathered at Code for Romania and their IT developers, their designers, their communication specialists, and their researchers. There's also people from academia. And that I was also interested to see the people that joined from there. And it's also usually senior people. They're, they're professors from the University of Cluj, from the University of Bucharest, but uh, usually, usually very, very good professionals in what they're doing already. Uh, so it's not what you usually define as volunteers or we're, mm -hmm. what we're usually uh, expected to, to find in a volunteer group. So, so we're trying to use more the pro bono. Mm -hmm. they're, they're offering their work pro bono uh, at the same standard that they're doing it in their day-to-day -day, day -to -day job. And then very important is that we have almost 20% of the Romanian population living abroad. Um, and there are not many channels for them to get engaged with Romania. I know because I lived for, for 10 years abroad as well, and uh, I think we offered some of them a chance to do that, because you can write lines of code, you can do design from anywhere in the world. So right now we have 11 time zones and around 150 people doing work from everywhere in the world. And Belina, what is your community like? What is the... the communities in Bucharest that you guys work with, and you mentioned already a, a criteria that you don't work with big organizations because they should have the means, some of mm -hmm. them have. So how does the communities 
how do these communities that you work with look like, mm -hmm. if that's how those look like? Uh, I would say that our communities as well are a bit older people. They are not students or people in uh, their first years of, of work. Uh, because these are the people who are looking for meaning and normally it's after the 30 the <laughs> years old crisis and actually what works for us, we, what we see is a, a, a strong community of mothers, mm -hmm. uh, people who are raising very young children uh, and they are on maternity leave and they have all the time and also they want to, to, to make an impact for their children, they want to work so that the, the world of uh, their children will be a little bit better. Um, actually, in the Community Foundations Network in Romania, I think half of the Community Foundations have been made by mothers on their maternity leave. So it's a, kind of a pattern there, <laughs> uh, which we can see. I, I myself started the Community Foundation on my maternity leave. So. Um, and, and I think uh, these are the people who actually are a bit are oh, above average in terms of education and income and people who have traveled a lot and who have seen examples from other communities that are working but are not willing to leave the country. They could live anywhere in the world but they are willing to stay here. Um, and last year we had a, a short movie about some of our people in the community that we are supporting and we asked questions about what does Bucharest mean to them and uh, why are, are they not giving up. Uh, and it looks like psychologically there is a struggle for them and it's a, actually not a struggle but a fight for them. They are fighting for this city, they are uh, trusting that they can uh, make create an impact here in the city with what they are doing. And um, a big question we had for us at Urboteca also being this interdisciplinary group, not all based in academia, was, okay, so we do research, it's not just for the purpose of research, it's for mobilizing communities, but what tools do we have? What means do we have? What instruments? And I would like to also explore um, what you do, what you consider to be instruments mm -hmm. for research, for knowledge, for mobilization, for funding, for support, for growing something that starts small and maybe mm -hmm. grows bigger. Um, and then the same to, to Bogdan and maybe focus a bit on some examples. Mm -hmm. So, um, Well, I think it's uh, like in any other big city, we cannot focus binary on only the needs or only the assets and we need to, to create a, um, a more complex structure. So we look on the one hand of, uh, on what are the needs in the community and what are the priority that the community considers are relevant for them and on the other hand we are trying to build on the assets that we found found in our in the communities that we are working with uh, meaning the professional expertise uh, the skills the knowledge the creativity uh, the experience from other projects and this desire to, to do good and on the one hand we are uh, using our uh, tool which is actually not our tool, we haven't created it, it's an international tool that community foundations use worldwide. Uh, it's called Vital Signs. Uh, Vital Signs is a collection of data existing in the local community. Um, actually, it's not data that is produced by the community foundation, but that is put together by the community foundation. Uh, uh, it's a different website. Uh, can you use a mic? It's really tiring. Uh, Okay. Hi, ah, okay, okay, it's good. Yeah. That's not what you yeah. yeah, that's all. Uh, you can try. Yeah. Uh, so, what Vital Science is doing, <coughs> what we are doing here locally, is look at the community from all perspectives from population and uh, economy and education and safety and everything, uh, and then try to find which are the biggest gaps uh, in the community that need to be filled and can be filled by uh, offering grants. And this is on the one hand. And then what would be those priority areas that make most sense, uh, meaning that if they are tackled, they would affect other uh, areas as well. And for instance, we are looking um, in Bucharest at belonging. Uh, I don't know how many from of you are from Bucharest. and 
how many of you are actually from Bucharest? <laughs> in our office, we only have one person who was born in Bucharest. The others are coming from everywhere. And this is normally the case in any capital city or big city uh, in the world. Uh, it is capturing people from all, all over the world. But people are coming because they find opportunities here and they don't necessarily feel that they belong. And if you don't feel that you belong to some place, um, it's like uh, employee engagement in the corporation. You leave when you get a bigger salary or when you like the, the other doormat or whatever. You just don't care very much. Uh, for us, we are looking, uh, in terms of belonging, belonging, we are looking at the levels of uh, donating and volunteering, the levels of voting, especially in local elections, um, the levels of protesting, that's a very cultural, local cultural <laughs> uh, perspective. Um, and it, it means that it, it, it is a sense of getting something from the community and also being responsible for the community and giving something back. And it, it, this is what creates energy uh, with the people. And we believe that we, if we increase this level of belonging, and we are trying to incorporate this in, in all our uh, grant making funds, then we will be able to increase uh, the level of anything uh, regarding the, the well-being of the community. And uh, going from vital signs, which proved to, to be a huge challenge in Bucharest because data is old and data is reliable and if you're looking in our presentation you'll see a lot of question marks because there, there is data as old as 10 years old, which of course is no longer valid and relevant. Uh, living from here, we started working on the design thinking methodology and trying to, to create funds and create projects that would increase the sense of belonging in Bucharest. And I think it's something that is relevant for any community, either it's geographical or a community of professionals. People need to feel that this is the place that they, where they want to be and they want to give something back and they want to take something um, as well. Uh, and also looking at the assets, and I'm going to finish here, we started uh, um, moving from uh, an organization that is a bit closed because we are working with just a number of donors and just a number of organizations and uh, beginning to be more um, conversation driven. Uh, starting last, last year we started having uh, open, open house sessions where we invite people from the community to uh, give feed feedback on our projects and to give feedback on what is needed in, uh, in the community further than uh, our projects. And it's not something that we can incorporate immediately and Definitely we are not promising that we are saving the city or we are going to solve all the issues and definitely some issues are not to be solved with private money. Uh, but discussing with people and offering this space where they can talk and have their uh, thoughts integrated is also contributing to the sense of belonging. So the way we find our focus is, is very similar to vital science. Uh, so the main program of Code for Romania is called Civic Lab, and it's the whole part of research that I was telling you about before. Um, so what we do is we take one one area. Uh, right now we're we're looking at disaster relief, and we're bringing uh, all stakeholders to the table. Uh, be it from uh, from the industry, be it from the uh, uh, from the non-profit area, or from from government agencies, and we discovered some time ago that they're not. It, it's they don't really know how to uh, put their needs into IT projects, and it, it's a big a big mistake to. Uh, uh, to wait for this to come from them. So what we're asking them is, what is their need? What are the blockages that they're facing every day in their, their activities? Uh, and it's an interesting process, and it's very hard to, to get over the, uh, the usual answer. What do you need? I need a software that does this. No, you don't need a software that does this. You must probably have a real need that can be solved through software or not, uh, in many cases. Not. Um, and then we validate those needs. We go through a whole process 
validation because it happened more than once for problems to be signaled to us by experts in the area or from institutions that, that work on that. And I'll give you one example. We, uh, two years ago, the Ministry of Labor came to us and said, uh, we need an app that tells disabled people how to get from point, uh, point A to point B through the city based on their disability. Uh, and it seemed reasonable, it seemed valid, uh, and uh, also if you think fast about it, most probably uh, a Waze type of uh, app could help them to, to give them the, uh, the route, to uh, the best route based on their disability and, and the access points that they have. And then we went through a whole summer of uh, research or focus group with each type of disability and we found out that they don't have that need. They don't have that need yet. Hopefully they will have it in a few years, but right now there are so few places in Bucharest that have access for disabled people that they already know the five or six places that they can go to. So, you know, it's not a chaos in their heads where they don't know, oh, how could I get from, from this point to the other? They already know if they can or not. Uh, and if we would have gone uh, went ahead and, uh, and built that product, most probably you'd give them only red routes that they can't access, which would make them even more stay uh, to stay indoors and, and not attempt to, to socialize or get out of the house. Um, so this validation process it is very important to us. Um, and, and, and then we go through the whole process of uh, prototyping and testing until we, we find a tech solution, if a tech solution is at hand and can help. Um, and, and we also engage our community. We get, engage our community to ask them what they would like to work on. Because being volunteers, we need to uh, make sure that they're passionate about it, because otherwise they won't finish that project. Uh, and we also need to, to be careful to have projects on a wide variety of areas because not everybody is interested in transparency and accountability. Uh, some people just want to work on an educational project and you need to give them that, uh, otherwise they, they, they don't engage in the work. And what was very important for our community is to have a strict set of rules and a strict routine of project management because they're accustomed to that from, uh, from, their, uh, from their work. They, they, they have this attitude that they don't want to waste time uh, at Code for Armenia. They want to use those two or three hours that they have in a, uh, on an evening night to, to, to just do the work. Um, so we need to be uh, able to offer them that. And we develop this project flows that works very well. And many, many of our uh, partners with organizations from all over the world were asking us, how did your volunteer accept such strict rules? Uh, and we told them they, they asked for them. So that, that may be another difference between the community in Romania and other civic tech communities worldwide. It's the taxi radio station that <laughs> <laughs> Okay, nice, thank and I think your question was also going to how do we fund this or... No, but it's a good one. <laughs> uh, so, so that has been a challenge because people, when, when we started, not many people knew what civic technology is, not many people understood how much investment you need uh, to be able to, 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 produce, uh, to produce these apps. And it's, it's still hard to explain to them that we need to invest the infrastructure that we need to invest in, uh, in research. Uh, because right now, it, there's a passion of just having hackathons and thinking, you know, we can solve something really fast in a day or two. No good solution can be born in, in one day or two without, without a prior research. So, so it's hard to explain. So building on this topic of financing and of not being self-sufficient, although you look like among 600 people, how do you build partnerships and with whom? And how much of that can be done through institutions that focus on, let's say, particularly research? And maybe uh, universities can do that. 
or how much do you collaborate with policy makers, decision makers? How much is the policy political aspect part of what you're thinking about? Partnerships that can scale, let's say, the work that you do. So part of, part of, I don't think it works. Do Part of the uh, Civic Lab uh, program is bringing the stakeholders together in, in, uh, in building and mapping the needs and building the, uh, the solutions. So we stay on a partnership with most of them as the project continues. And just to give you an example, we have the Open Data Portal, which I think is up there as well. And we're talking, we're now putting the basis of deploying a data portal to Cluj and Timisoara municipalities. And there we have a close partnership with many stakeholders. And I'll give you the example of Timisoara, where we're partnering with the university. And the university is helping out with assessing the, uh, the data sets that the municipality has and to, to find problems with them and, uh, and to clean the data before it goes into the data portal. Uh, of course, with our support as well, and then we have a number of organizations from Timisoara, uh, which were engaging in the communication phase of the project and in the um, public consultation phase of the project. So we're trying to be brought in a coalition of I think six or seven organizations besides the municipality. So this is usually how, how we're trying to, to work as inclusive as possible. We're also in a good position to do that because for the ones that know Romania, also know that many times among NGOs that do kind of the same work or among institutions that do the same work, there is a lot of competition. Uh, but we're in a luxury position because we produce something that they want and we produce at no cost or very little cost. Um, and the condition for us is that everything is open source and we need them to cooperate. And they usually do it because it's the only way of, of getting what they want from us. And also I will be adding that you're all working with some local administrations that think a little bit more visionarily than the others. Yeah. Um, I can remember three, times, three years ago when we were doing the strategy for the next year, uh, one point in the strategy, strategy was follow the local elections and see what comes out of it and what partnerships we can build afterwards. And after the local elections, we erased it <laughs> and we are keeping it erased for probably until uh, 2020. Um, we are trying to hack what we are doing in terms of partnerships. We are trying to look into the private resources, meaning on the one hand the money, the private money, and on the other hand, uh, private initiative, uh, people who do do this work because they believe in it, not because it's a job for them. Uh, so far it's working. We are also aware that you cannot scale up too much without taking into consideration the local administration. That would be foolish to imagine that. Um, and we are now working on a, on a program, on a crowd making program, which is going to be uh, very large and it, it is about uh, how Bucharest is prepared uh, about earthquakes. And this is something you can do up to a point uh, with only local resources, but it's definitely not something that you can do without taking into consideration what's happening in the local administration. And it's not right, because no matter how much money you can raise from private sources, you cannot compete with the local administration. So here, it's going to be for us the next step, which is painful. You are working on an app that Gre also knows. He's part of that project called Seismic Alert. Uh, it's an awareness. It's building awareness about the, right? The and, an, and an ecosystem of apps to be used after the earthquake okay. as well. And this is a fund also to build awareness on the fragility of uh, not just the awareness, but also to prepare okay. um, individuals and to create systems that uh, prevent further damage. 
Of course, we cannot stop the earthquake from coming and we cannot fix all the buildings, but what we can do is that we can prevent people from doing foolish things such as uh, running down the stairs or jumping out of the window or creating systems in which children uh, can simulate what it means to, to be part of an earthquake and so that they are not scared and don't jump one on top of the other uh, at school. Um, so it's a little bit further than uh, just creating awareness. Uh, it's also about creating systems of uh, first aid, which is something that we don't have in, in, uh, in Romania. And it will be connected at one point of uh, what code is of So maybe without a very clear methodology, although you do, you both have strategies, you had a briefing formula, form, form that I remember was very uh, insistent on why do you think there is a need to have research to back it up, who are the beneficiaries of these, who are the stakeholders you plan to get involved, so you know all this. Um, and it's interesting that this is a way of raising issues up from the grassroots or from what's actually hurting, in this case in Bucharest, or globally, because you also glo work globally. So that's another thing. And just a small mention before opening the debate, what uh, Bogdan has been working on together with the huge community of volunteers also is to um, having up to speed monitorizar a vote, because this weekend we have a two-day referendum um, and a form of protest uh, include actually being an observer. So besides having the greatest uh, civic tech um, conference next week, they also had to work for this weekend for this. So just problems popping up, not necessarily best planned. Timing. Yes, the best timing. We had an event, we had to reschedule it. Anyway, so I would open the floor to questions. Uh, I'm, um, I'm coming from Ukraine. Uh, I feel many um, similar, I have many similar feelings regarding technology and its power to change the society, especially in these cases of uh, mistrust uh, to the authorities and um, yeah. So I got very many questions, <laughs> but uh, I would like to maybe try to ask just one. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, and the question is, um, what come in, in your opinion? What come first, the need for technology or the technology? Um, because often, yeah, we do technology for some specific need for some community for some, um, and uh, there is a big power for this kind of self-organized. Uh, uh, union of uh, programmers, for example, to make the services, but at the same time there is a power of disrupting technology which comes first and then finds its um, use. So do you also, um, do you also um, experiment, uh, do you also uh, dedicate some resources and time for this experimental approach or uh, first of all we focused on the first order project of the need. So yeah, I think it's a very good question because we have a tendency to fetishize technology and to fetishize some buzzwords that are in fashion at one point or the other. Right now it's uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, and speaking about donors I was asked few weeks ago by a possible donor. Oh, and don't you want to put some artificial intelligence in this project? Perfect. No, because it, it doesn't fit with, with the project. Uh, so, you know, we always need to think of technology as a tool. Uh, one friend of mine who's a civic technologist in South Africa called it, you know, it's, it's like language. You, know, you use language when you need it, it's, it's a tool. Uh, so you first need to look at the need. Sometimes you can't solve the needs only with technology, or maybe not at all with technology. Uh, a good example is preparedness for the earthquake. We can build the best technology ever, and if people don't inform others, they don't have trainings what to do in case of earthquakes, this cannot be done with, with technology. 
So, so we need to, to look outside, and we need to build technology that is feasible and solves. Uh, uh, it's a good solution for that problem at you know the lowest cost possible. Because of course, compared to technology for profit, we also don't have a lot of resources. So, so we need to be uh, to mind to mind that as well. And also, what we're investing a lot is reusing. So we don't re need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, a lot of technology is being built around the world. A lot of civic technology is being built around the world, and we need to find out about it and use it uh, for for uh, to solve our problems. Ushahidi is an example. I think it's it's the most redeployed civic technology in history. But for example, my interesting vote that we we built was used in, in the elections in Mexico. A few months ago, will be used in elections in Poland in, in this month, in October. So, you know, there's already a technology for uh, monitoring elections. There's no need to, to build it anew. If you want to do something about it, you know, build new features to it or add to it. Richard from, from London with a question. I'd like to understand and hear from you um, your, your ideas around uh, digital exclusion, around uh, groups within society who, who uh, for whatever reason, uh, find it difficult to be able to access what you are doing. And I thought of the question when you were talking about the app for disabled people. Because clearly uh, there will be uh, a number of disabled people who wouldn't be comfortable or able to use the app that you that you were considering. So I, I'm just interested to find out your your analysis of this situation and how you are trying to do something about that and include that within your overall work. So there there are three. Things here. First of all, we need to design it to be used by as many people as possible, uh, and you know that's also again why we need research uh, to look what the users want, what the users might uh, might uh, might use. Monitor is that what is an app that uh, that is native on iOS and Android phones, smartphones. Uh, now we're working on adding an SMS feature for it. Because in some countries, people don't have so many smartphones as in Romania or Poland, where we deploy it. Uh, we want to redeploy it in Moldova, Republic of Moldova. They don't have so many smartphones there. We need to add features to, uh, to, to be able to be used by those people. Um, and we need to, be, to know that we will not reach everybody. Uh, and that answers, again, the question, technology cannot solve all the problems. Uh, we will not reach everybody. So we need to assess if it's worth it building such a technology in a case. For example, if you know you have the problem of pet adoption, and we, if we find out that the people that usually adopt pets wouldn't use technology or don't have access to that technology, it's of no use of building. So we shouldn't even try. The, the, second, the second point is that we need to make uh, technology accessible to disabled people. And there are some protocols about it, there, there are some ways of doing that, and we're not an organization that does policy, but the only point of policy that we're trying to push is for the institutions at least to make their websites, to make their applications accessible to disabled people. Um, and there are clear ways of doing it. Um, and we should put more effort into that. And the third point is that you know we usually think of technology as software, as something that resides in our mobile phones. But sometimes it can be hardware, it can be something else. Uh, there is a big success now with sensors for pollution uh, that are used all across the world. There is also big success with sensors that test the water and tell you if it's drinkable or not. That has a lot of success across Africa and saves lives across Africa, even though those people don't have smartphones and don't have access to computers or internet, technology still helps them through this hardware. 